my sweet Jamaica. Hi there. Welcome to another edition of Jamaica Magazine. I'm Adrian Atkinson. In today's show, we continue the celebration of Jamaica's 55th anniversary of independence with reflections on the contributions of national heroes Sir Alexander Bustamante and Norman Washington Manley. Sit back and relax for these and more to come as we turn the pages of Jamaica Magazine. Let's celebrate Jamaica to the world. Fastest man in the world. First Jamaican woman to win gold in Olympic 100 meter sprint. An upcoming global superstar. Mouth watering meals. And a vibrant set of people. We are Jamaicans. Let's get together and bring back the love. He is one of the most strident political figures of pre- and post-independent Jamaica, was a champion for the poor and working class. Sir Alexander Bustamante, a vanguard for human rights and national development, watch this feature to know more about the only Jamaican to receive the honor of national hero while still alive. one of the great movers and shakers of Jamaica's development. A hero in the eyes of a nation, he worked hard to improve and protect from many injustices within his time. Alexander Bustamante knew what was required to improve the plight of the common man and tried to make that happen. What we need in this island is not more men, but more men with courage with the spirit of fighting for justice for all, and more so for the less fortunate, independent men who will sacrifice their own interests for their unfortunate sisters and brothers. His heroic life journey began in this small rural district of Blenheim in Hanover. Here, in this small cottage nestled in the cool hills, the son of Robert and Mary Clark was born. It was February 24, 1884. He was named William Alexander Clark. Young Alexander was among other young men who were forced to seek employment abroad when jobs in Jamaica proved scarce. He had changed his surname from Clark to Bustamante by the time he returned to Jamaica in 1933. It was after starting a money-lending business in Jamaica that he became fully aware of the harsh reality of poverty faced by most Jamaicans. Low wages, bad working conditions, um, people were not regarded as, as people, they were just factors of production. Bustamante chose to preoccupy himself with improving the prevailing conditions. He began with writing numerous letters to the Daily Gleaner and occasionally to British papers as a means of exposing the extremely bad social and economic conditions of the masses. He made it known that human beings were not supposed to work under conditions where the wages were so low that they were unable to feed themselves and to feed their children. By the time he was near his 50th year, Bustamante's advocacy had evolved, with him becoming an active mediator in workers' strikes. Something new was happening in Jamaica, in which he would play a central role. The poor and oppressed had passed the stage where they could be bullied into submission by the guns and bayonets of the then colonial forces. Bustamante's voice grew loud in support of the workers' struggles and in contempt of the governing authority. His speeches, mediating and organizing activities slowly replaced the people's disorganized resentment to the oppressive forces of the colonial government with organized resistance. 
The charismatic, influential speaker drew large crowds at union rallies and organized and supported numerous strikes. In May 1938, he founded the Bustamante Industrial Trade Union, BITU. He had grown into a strong political figure and began working with his cousin Norman Manley and others to form a new political movement, the People's National Party, PNP. At the same time, his clashes with the authorities continued, and on September 8, 1940, Bustamante was detained at Up Park Camp for the alleged violation of the Defense of the Realm Act. He was released in 1942 and soon after successfully formed his own political body in the form of the Jamaica Labour Party in 1943. The next year, universal adult suffrage was instituted, allowing all Jamaicans the right to vote. In the December 1944 general election that followed, Bustamante's JLP won the majority of the 32 seats in the House of Representatives. Because of the great work he did as a trade unionist, it was not difficult for him to get the people together to vote for him. At his second victory at the polls in 1949, Bustamante became the unofficial government leader as Minister for Communication until the position of Chief Minister was created in 1953. In late 1953, Bustamante was honored by Britain's Queen with the title Knight Bachelor and was addressed Sir Bustamante. He was named Jamaica's first Prime Minister when the country gained independence from Britain in 1962. And later that year, married longtime associate and union colleague Gladys Longbridge. Sir William Alexander Bustamante received the Order of National Hero of Jamaica in 1969 for his immense contribution to Jamaica's politics and dedication to improving the conditions of workers. He died at the age of 93 on August 6, 1977. Respecting yourself, how you carry yourself, is very important. You hear me, young men? Yes, we take for granted, oftentimes, as men, that people judge you before you even open your mouth. From they look at you, they form a perception. They make up their minds about you. So the question is, when they look at you, what do they see? I say that the mission of my generation was to win self-government for Jamaica, to win political power, which is the final power for the black masses of my country, from which I spring. Whose words, you may guess? If you said national hero Norman Washington Manley, you're right. Up next, more on the other of the two founding fathers of modern-day Jamaica. The national flag flies proudly beside the childhood home of the right excellent Norman Washington Manley, symbolizing his status as a national hero and his contribution to Jamaica's journey to nationhood. His involvement in the country's campaign to independence was rooted in his resentment of the lack of rights for the poor working class. He was a man who devoted much of his life to looking after what we call the underdog. That was one of the things which drove him relentlessly as a political leader. And his advocacy, which had begun years earlier, took on a more defined role when he rose to lead the newly formed People's National Party in 1938. We have to see uh, Norman Manley's role in 1938 as a period in which he demonstrated his capacity 
for reconciliation and negotiation. He was in touch with the governor, in touch with the unions, in touch with the business people. He, his characteristic was trying to reconcile and bring together the contending forces and arrive at a solution to the issues. As a statesman, Manley refused to be satisfied with the universal adult suffrage in 1944. He had bigger dreams, among them to see Jamaica take full control of its own affairs. So he became deeply involved in the move to develop a new constitution and the fight for full independence from Britain. Norman Manley believed that the organization of the people in the political parties would be the instrument through uh, the vehicle through which Jamaica would be able to decolonize itself from the dominance of British rule. So the Constitution basically was an attempt to put in writing what is unwritten in British. The British Constitution is not a single document. This is referred to as unwritten, but that's not entirely accurate. It's just that it's not codified in a single uh, document. We attempted to extract from British experience those principles that would then shape the Jamaican constitution. He tried to get a constitution that would reflect both the aspirations of the Jamaican people, but would also allow for that system to operate in a harmonious way that would ensure the full participation of the citizenry consistent with a parliamentary democracy. N.W. Manley was the consummate statesman and politician driven by his need to seek the welfare of the people. As leader of the People's National Party, he got his first taste of victory in 1955 when Jamaicans went to the polls. It was a vindication of all that he had campaigned for. He regarded it as a mandate to put in place programs that would result in the social transformation and the economic growth of Jamaica. The national hero and chief minister left an extensive legacy. In addition to his role in obtaining universal adult suffrage in 1944, N.W. Manley also founded the National Workers' Union in 1952. Two years later, in 1954, he led efforts to secure executive powers for elected representatives. Under the colonial system, elected officials, their power was balanced off by the nominated officials who the governor nominated. So that between 1944 and 1953, although Bustamante had won the election, he had no power because they, had, they were no ministers, as it were. It was also under Norman Manley's leadership that Jamaica achieved full internal self-government in 1959, a precursor to political independence that would come three years later. What that means is that we had responsibility for all the portfolios that dealt with internal developments, but the governor was still responsible for foreign affairs, for defense, and for justice. Under the independence, you, you um, are responsible now, you are managing your external affairs and determining who you trade with, who you have political relations with, and that's not determined by uh, Britain or by the governor in, as a representative of Britain in Jamaica. With Manley at the helm, the government established the Bank of Jamaica, the Development Bank of Jamaica, and the College of Arts, Science and Technology cast, now the University of Technology. And among the indelible contributions which he has made to the entire Jamaican society was the granting of 2,000 
three places in secondary schools during the 1950s. And most of the professionals, the engineers, the doctors, the accountants, the lawyers, the public administrators, and so much of our creative talent was the direct product of that flowering of the opening of opportunity for all. His legacy also includes the Small Business Loan Board, the Jamaica Welfare Limited, now called the Social Development Commission, the Foundation of Youth Service, and the success in securing land tenure for fathers. Manley's dedicated service to Jamaica earned him the Order of National Hero, the highest award to be bestowed on a citizen. Norman Washington Manley led a busy and public life in service to his country. We know he was an athlete, soldier, and brilliant lawyer, but those who knew him admired him for other reasons. He also had a passion for outdoor life, so he liked horse riding and he would retreat um, to the hills where he was a master axeman and he did it not only for uh, physical fitness but for him to watch him cutting down a tree was a little short of a work of art. An avid reader and love of classical music he was also a fearless driver. Everyone knows, of course, he was a fast driver. And um, I can recall occasions coming home from meetings in the country when he would tell his driver, pull over, he would go to the wheel and sitting in the back seat, you would shut your eyes and pray that you would get home safely. Norman Manley was also a family man. He married his cousin Edna in 1921 and together they produced two boys. It was a close-knit family of achievers uh, with Edna Manley in the art world as a sculptor um, with but also very committed to politics and to the development of the nationalist movement because they saw themselves not simply as party people but as belonging to a national movement. And the boys, Douglas and Michael, followed in their father's footsteps. Douglas Manley tried to compete in the athletic sphere and broke his father's 100 yards record, which had been in existence for 30 years. And um, Michael Manley, the youngest son, uh, followed his father's footsteps in becoming party leader in 1969 and serving as Prime Minister of Jamaica for uh, two terms in the 1970s and one term after 1989. Undoubtedly, Norman Washington Manley was devoted to excellence, the fulfillment of purpose and the promotion of human dignity. He gave us a confidence in ourselves, a belief that there was nothing that Jamaicans could not achieve. Uh, no level of performance beyond their grasp. Revered as the father of the nation, Manley was an inspiring leader who touched the lives of Jamaicans home and abroad, making an indelible mark internationally and in the region. In his final speech in 1969, he asserted that the mission of his generation was to accomplish political power for the black masses of the people from which he sprang. Mission accomplished, he declared. And having accomplished his mission, Norman Washington Manley died on September 2, 1969. If you are watching the JIS, you're always in the know when it comes to government information and news. Keep watching, keep informed, and tell your friends. JIS, your number one source for government info. Yo, we don't want to lose you. 
That's why we are counting on you to stay safe on the road. Drinking and driving and speeding are a recipe for death and disaster. As to using your cell phone while driving, a mad thing that. Yeah, man, either thing to call, surf the net, text, or visit the Facebook page while driving. Do not use your cell phone while driving. If it is really urgent that you use your cell phone, pull over at a safe location on the road. Arrive alive. Don't use your cell while you drive. Let us go for road safety. All the time, every time. A message from the NRSC and NHF. Hi there, I'm Simone Wolf with your JIS News of the Week. Government has met six of the ten Economic Growth Council policy recommendations targeted for implementation during the April to June quarter. The Development Bank of Jamaica set out a protocol for the establishment of enterprise teams that handle multiple transactions and submitted to Cabinet a protocol for outsourcing the privatization of government-owned entities. During this period, the Ministry of National Security also conducted a feasibility study for the creation of global, a global immigration card, and the DBJ expanded access to financing through its various credit fac facilities and the exploration of the facility to allow unclaimed funds in the banking and insurance sector to be released to fund MSMEs. <music> Prime Minister Andrew Holness has signaled government's intent to negotiate a new infrastructure development agreement with the Chinese government after the current one expires. He was speaking on Thursday at the opening of the $700 million Cupius Bridge at Penance in Clarendon. This investment says that the government of Jamaica recognizes the importance of this area, respects the people who live in this area, sees the economic potential of the area and want to see it maximized. And that this area is an important part of the productive band within the country. And we want to connect it. Education Minister Senator Ruel Reed says there is money available to help schools that may be facing funding shortfalls have adequate funding in our system to deal with um, any particular uh, challenges. We are funding the core services. What we have said is that co-curricular and um, competitive sports and other special programs, those are areas that they will have to seek uh, stakeholder support to fund those. Senator Reid insists that he has received no funding complaints from schools and is encouraging institutions to contact the ministry if they are experiencing challenges. Contact the education officer or the regional director um, directly, and they will um, make contact with central ministry. National Security Minister Robert Montague has approved an interim plan of action for the Firearm Licensing Authority, the FLA. This follows the resignation of the board in light of alleged improprieties at the authority. The actions were outlined by Information Minister Senator Royal Reed at a Jamaica House press briefing on Wednesday. The Firearm Licensing Authority should not issue any approval for gun licenses or permits for the next seven working days. Two, the Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Shane Darling, over the same period of seven working days, will provide an update of the process of the Ministry of National Security Assessment Report on the Firearm Licensing Authority 2017 Allen Report and the status of the implementation of the recommendations to the Minister. Government is looking to implement a new framework for public sector salary negotiations during the 2017-2019 contract period. Among other things, the provisions propose to extend the contract period from two to three years, which will be discussed with the unions. The revised negotiation calendar will enable prudent forecasting of compensation costs and will facilitate the timely payment of benefits to employees, which should be at the beginning of each financial year. 
The Tourism Enhancement Fund will be spending $1.2 billion over the next four years in Montego Bay to give the resort town a facelift. We're going to be reconfiguring the entire area from what is proverbially called Dumper Beach straight through to Dead End, which includes the hip strip that is occupying your mind somewhat. Somebody will want me to tell you that the private and public sector together have combined to create a new look experience that is going to define a new attraction and indeed a new presence of Montego Bay in the global tourism market. And finally, the Tourism Enhancement Fund, TEF, has spent $28 million to construct a new ice cream shop at Devon House. Tourism Minister Edmund Bartlett says the expansion of the parlor forms part of a greater effort to market Devon House as the epicenter of gastronomy in Kingston. We do have intentions to build out a Caribbean experience that will involve gastronomy and culinary tourism. But we want to lead it from Jamaica. And we want to marry it with the other culinary delights of the region. And to ensure that when you leave Devon House, it's not just ice cream, but it's all the wonderful delicacies that are so inherent in this excellent cuisine, which has come out of the confluence of cultures and ethnicity of our people. And those were some of the stories making news this week. I'm Simone Wolf. The most vibrant aspect of Jamaica's history is no doubt our culture. The Jamaica Cultural Development Commission has been having its usual set of events during this celebratory period. There are so many dying souls in the world today Needing someone to show them the way There you are, hiding in your corner Though you see the need for one more soldier on the battlefield, you think you cannot make it in the army led by Jesus Christ. And even though he has been calling, calling your name, fear causes you to And that brings us to the end of today's edition of Jamaica Magazine. Join us again tomorrow when we'll do this all over again. Until then, you can click online at jis.gov.jm and visit our YouTube channel to get the latest government information. Also, follow us on Twitter and Facebook and download our app from the Google Play Store to stay informed. I'm Adrian Atkinson, reminding you to come out and enjoy Grand Gala at Independence Park on August 6th. Until next time, take care of your health, exercise, eat well, get adequate rest, and make every day a productive one. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.